Hey everybody, this is David Delaney with the Sales Development Podcast. I want to thank you for tuning in. If you're new to the show or new to this series, we're doing a four-part series going from being in the corporate world to becoming an entrepreneur. And we call it the Freedom Fighter Series. It's a little bit different than how we usually do it, where we talk to sales development leaders and, and professionals to get their strategies and tips. But super relevant to anybody in the sales development world because at the end of the day, we're in charge of our own destiny here and we are sort of entrepreneurs within the companies where we work. So I really hope that you enjoy this and we'll do four of these and then we'll go back to our regularly scheduled programming of talking to leaders in the sales development space and reps in the sales development space. Thank you so much. Please do leave a comment and let us know if you like this series, if you want more, if you want to talk to more entrepreneurs, and if you don't like it, we we want to hear that as well. Thanks again, and we'll talk soon. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Sales Development Podcast. I am really, really stoked to introduce you to my next guest, Mr. Chris Landry, formerly SDR to inside sales to field sales rep to a leader. VP level at Dell Boomi, who just started a SaaS company called Sig Parser and is just a treasure trove of information about this subject. So Chris, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, David. I really appreciate it. Absolutely, man. So Chris, you know, it's funny because we've talked a few times and I just feel like I'm scratching the surface of your knowledge in this area. So I can't wait to share this information with the guests. I want to learn about your background, how you came up through the ranks, and then I want to learn about your company, Sig Parser, and what you're doing to help other companies. Yeah, for sure. And I'll just before I kick off, as you and I were talking before, I want to make sure that you know I really love what you're doing. I think you've got an awesome podcast, and I think you've got a really cool organization that you're building. And I think this this market has a, a real need to be serviced with more information. And I think things are doing are really, really cool because it's really important to the SaaS companies that are starting out. So I'll just say that, which is I'm a big believer in the sales development process and you know all the things that are going on in the SDR world that, that are making SaaS companies better. So thanks. I appreciate it. Awesome. You got it, man. This is, this is, this is great. It's an exciting time for the industry. And I mean, I'm looking at that SIG parser and what you guys are doing. How did you get into this and how did you how did you start this whole thing? Yeah. Well, it started with just a background in sales, you know, from from me being actually starting out as an SDR. So my first job out of college was actually as a sales development rep for a company called Siebel Systems, which used to be the, you know, the big CRM player in the market before we had Salesforce. And so I literally got my job because one of my buddies had gotten in there and said, Hey, you should come up and check this out after I got out of college. They wouldn't give me a job, but they gave me part-time work doing something, trying to sell it was like some training program. But they made the mistake of, of literally putting me outside of the uh, director of worldwide sales development, his office. Time his name was Anthony. And I literally, just for the two-month like short-term gig I had, I knocked on his door every single day because I already interviewed with him and said, hey, I really want a job. He's like, you don't have enough experience. But after two months of me hounding him and bugging him, he finally decided to give me a shot. So I, I started out literally just like cleaning out this inbox when I when I finally got my first SDR job, this email inbox that used to go out and do blasts where they would invite people to seminars. And then I just got onto the phones from there, started doing outbound SDR work, obviously went into inside sales and field sales. Uh, and then years later, became a regional manager and an RVP, most recently at Boomi, where I was running a team of field sales people as well as uh, regional managers. And I, I actually, the idea for Sigparser started like six years ago, where I just realized you know, there's a huge amount of data as a salesperson. This is when I was actually a salesperson sitting in my inbox. I didn't want to do the manual data entry. I knew this, the information was valuable, not only to me, but to the company. And I just thought there had to be a better way. And so, you know, I endeavored to go out and, and start this company that can mine a inbox and grab all the contact details and email signatures and turn them into contacts in Salesforce or other CRM systems so that the reps don't have to do any manual data entry. And so that's kind of how I got all the way from, from there to, you know, first time founder here in the last few years. I love that. I mean, that is such a pain in the neck to have to go through and like update everything <laughs> manually. So I yeah. want to dive into how you came up with that. But my, I'm curious about, I mean, you know, how did you claw your way up the ranks like that? I mean, sales is such a hard position, you know, and, and it's, yeah. it's difficult for people. I mean, you, you tend to like spin your wheels a lot. And, and, you know, you literally came up from, you know, digging out through somebody's email box on a daily basis yeah. 
running a team? I mean, what was it that propelled you like that? You know, I think I just wanted to, I wanted to be successful. I wanted to do well in sales. And, you know, I'd, I'd gotten into this job at Siebel and it was a really, really competitive environment. And so I think that I just was given opportunities too. you know, after, a, I think the thing I'd say too, and I can kind of maybe speak to this a bit later is I think if you're really diligent and you really focus on, on being a solid, you know, sales development rep, then you can do a few things that really help you stand out and help you get promoted. You know, some of the things are like work ethic. Some of them are really demonstrating that you understand the market that you're operating in. Some of them are being like self-aware and like showing uh, the people who might hire you into the next role that you really are mature enough to be there. I think that's probably the, the biggest one that people may not really understand that well, but I think a lot of leaders are looking for that. And so I just, I tried to constantly get better at what I was doing. And I always was going to talk to the people who were in the inside sales organization when I was at Siebel, asking them for, for roles and saying, hey, when's the next one going to come up? When can I interview? What do I need? And, and asking very point blank, hey, what do I need to do to get a job on your team? What do you need to see from me? And those were all things that were really valuable because it put me on their radar and it also gave me a chance to get feedback on what I needed to do to get the next job. And then also hold them to the fact that if I did all those things and they didn't give me the job or something like that happened, I could basically say, but, you know, hey, we talked about this almost like, you know, an upfront contract, if you will. Right. So just uh, just being there, actually like being able to sell them on why why I might be ready for the next step. Now, let me ask you. So for somebody who wants to get ahead and they want to get promoted. Now, it sounds like you you were never afraid to go up and just ask people like <laughs> within the organization. You were making your yeah. way you know, through there and, and, you know, showing up and, and doing a great job, but also asking. And I think that that's, that's hard for some people. Like they don't want to be annoying or stuff like that. But I mean, what, 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 what made you want to or push through that fear and like, just go do it? Well, I think at the end of the day, you eventually just want something enough that you get over your fear, right? Like, yeah. I think that's, I think that's the, the step one. I think a lot, I mean, people who are doing the job as a sales development rep are already, they're selling, right? They're out there and they're, they're cold calling people. They're figuring out how to get a meeting. And so those skills are all transferable. I think if you start to think about it like, well, you know, I don't want to bug somebody, you know, internally, you have to remember that when, when you're in an organization who's looking for talent to go into sales, they really, they want to talk to you. And if they think you're one of the people that can be one of their next rock stars, They want to find you early. So it's a benefit to them. So I I think the way you do it is important because they they probably do want to know about you. So I think one is just kind of like getting over that initial fear that you're bugging them and just go up and start talking to people. You could probably probably actually find people like a great way for me and I think really helped is you want to get some sponsorship, right? So do really well at your job. You know, be a really rock solid SDR who's putting up the numbers, who's delivering high quality leads and high quality meetings and get your sales reps to stand up and say, Hey, you know, this guy or girl is doing great. Like you guys should really look at them. I think they might have what it takes because that's the first step towards like a signal to management that maybe there's somebody who's really interesting here that we need to be talking to. And so I think if you do those things and, and your field sales reps are happy and the people that you're working with are happy, then they can help kind of naturally kind of raise you up. I also think that if you can find someone who's a mentor you know, this is talked about a lot and I think they're really important, but if you can find somebody who can just help you get some more visibility and you can ask them for help in what they've done. Again, it could be a field sales rep that you work with. It could be your, it could be your manager. It could be your director. It could be a number of people, but you know, once you establish a little bit of credibility, you should go looking for somebody else in the organization who can help kind of give you some guidance. And then those mentors and all those people who are, you're doing good work for, I think eventually start to kind of bubble up the information that you're probably a really good person for them to look at to take the next step. So asking sponsorship, mentorship, having all those three together. Now, as you moved up and you became the leader at the Del Boomi, for example, do you remember, did anybody ever come up to you and be like, hey, you know, I'm totally crushing it. I want to get promoted. Or did you see anybody like do that? Or was it just like you? No, we, I mean, we saw a lot of that. I got, so I, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You can have another question there. I didn't want to cut you off. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I do. Did you have any experience being on the other side? Well, so I did, but not at Del Boomi. My, the other side I had was getting my first inside sales job was at Siebel as well. And interestingly enough, I think, I think as an SDR, you learn a lot about just kind of the process and mechanics of trying to get meetings. But I think that for me still to this day, one of the biggest leaps in terms of like advancement of my real skills that are still with me today was an inside sales. So like I still have those. So when you go from trying to qualify a lead to actually doing a full sales cycle, 
and running it end to end, it's just a lot different when you get from one side of the fence to the other side of the fence. When you're on, you know, you kind of the age old thing you hear is like an SDR will pass late and go, gosh, even I, you know, anyone could close that deal. That thing's going to close in like two days. And yet it didn't close or something happened. Right. And, and I think what happens is you get over to the other side of the fence when you're first in inside sales and you realize how hard it is to close a deal. That when people are just talking to you, it's one thing, but then when you're asking them for the, the money, it's yet another thing. But, but that gap there, if you make it to that inside sales role, those skills you learn there, I think are the most valuable set of skills that you learn in your career because it's the first time you're getting a real look at what it takes to close a deal. And then those, all those skills are super transferable as you head up into the field because you learn things like strip lining, you understand qualification, you know how to really differentiate your technology. You start to understand like different ways you've got to get the customer engaged and you understand the political environment that you're going into and maybe who you need to get to sign here and this person influence that person. And so it's all that stuff that happens in the inside sales organization that I think is, is transferable to the field and just in a broader way. So anyways, long story short, I'd say that I think that, that move is a really important one and you learn a lot. And so when I was at Siebel, I went and got from, went from being a sales development rep. I had a few field sales people who were really, really valuable to me in the sense that they, you know, kind of had recommended me to their managers as someone I should talk to because they were on the inside sales organization. I made some relationships with some people, like a couple different managers, you know, to try and just get to know them and make sure, like I'd said before, that I knew what they were looking for. So by the time I did get promoted in that inside sales organization, you know, I'd kind of had a few different people vouching for me and some people who, who thought I could do the job. You have that lined up. And now are there some tips or anything that you could give sales development reps who want to make that jump as far as what should they, should they be studying? What should they be doing beyond like building their support network and things like that? Are there any other things that they could be doing proactively? Yeah, I think, so I'll kind of give you some general guides of like, so like when I was at Boomi, we started when we actually built out the sales development organization. I think there was probably, well, actually, I should say I was quasi a part of it because obviously I was on the field sell side, but kind of my, you know, my peer and someone who I worked really closely with was a guy named Spence Culpepper who ran the sales development organization and he ran it globally. So, you know, he and I collaborated a lot because, you know, his business was driving my business and my business impacted his business. And so we were, I think, a really good team in terms of really trying to make sure that we had good synergies in terms of how we all work together. And so I mentioned this because you know, when he started his organization, there were only maybe four sales development reps. I think today there's probably over a hundred globally. And we didn't really have a real big career path for people because the jump from sales development to field sales was so big. It just, I don't think that's a really viable path. I think it's a really hard thing for people to do. And I, and I don't think that you're doing the sales development rep any favors by, by dropping them into that type of environment because the stakes are so high with those deals. And because the knowledge gap from going from SDR to being in sales is so big that you're just kind of setting them up to, to be in a really tough spot. But that inside sales job is the one that I think you can then, you know, ladder it up, right? You go from SDR, you go to inside sales, and then you go to the field. And so anyways, I say, I say this because we built, or we being Boomi, but Spence built an inside sales organization. So then all of a sudden we had a career path for these SDRs to go from being an SDR to being an inside sales. And then I had a chance, you know, to promote one of the first inside salespeople out to the field. And it was just a really natural thing to do. When it came time, that person was like, that's a no brainer. And so the things that this person, his name is Brian had, was that he had done really well as a sales development rep. And he knew our product, like he could speak really well about our product. I think that's one of the things that a lot of the SDRs need to realize is, is that, you know, one of the things you should differentiate on is, is knowing your product and knowing your market because of this, those are the things you can control. You, you obviously can't control that you don't have years and years of experience. But what you can control is, hey, I'm, I'm, I really know this space. I'm really working hard to learn it. And then that can get you into that inside sales job where you can then develop those skills even further. And so by the time that Brian was knocking on our door saying, hey, I'm ready for the next move, we all agreed. And we all thought that this was a perfect thing to happen. And in fact, it was the best thing for our organization because Brian was so well-trained that one of the tick boxes we look at when we're hiring field sales people especially in a really complicated market where Boomi sold, you know, integration as a service. So like basically like a, a service bus in the cloud was that, you know, it would take us sometimes, you know, a really long time, maybe, maybe a year to get people productive. And a lot of field sales companies in SaaS have this problem is it's time to productivity. 
So one of the things that if you are an SDR and then you go to inside sales and then you try and get in the field, one of the things that you really need to be able to tick off is saying, hey, that time to productivity is, is minimal for me. So yeah, you can go hire somebody with more experience, but how long is it going to take them to ramp and how quickly are you going to get them to a point where they can actually understand our market and close deals? So I think the people that are coming up from that role should be really, really focused on that so that they can say that that's not an issue and, and that should help them you know, get the next role. And it, in our case, and the reason I said it was the perfect thing to do is that we didn't have to take that productivity hit. He was productive day one. And then the other things that he had that were really good, that were also kind of part and parcel of this was, you know, he, he didn't have a big ego. He was really, really uh, hardworking. He was super collaborative with everybody he had worked with. So everybody who had worked with him was like, gosh, not only is he, is he smart and talented, but, you know, he's super easy to work with. He's great in a team. So at that point, it was just, it was a super no brainer. And I think everybody should think about those things because they're all important and, and, and people in the field want to see that level of maturity and being able to collaborate with others, I think is a sign of that. Whoever that is, is probably going to get recruited after this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. That's why I didn't give the last name, right? Yeah. <laughs> I know. We'll, we'll, we'll anonymize that. Part, but. So let me ask you this, because you, you do, you do see out there, you know, folks who go from SDR to inside sales, for example, and they struggle because it's like the, the SDR job you thought was going to lead right into being an inside sales, but it's actually quite different. And yeah. someone's out there like struggling at this point, like they finally got the inside sales job, but now they're struggling. What advice would you give them to potentially get it on track? Yeah. So one is, I think the first advice is, hey, don't worry, this is normal right? Like everybody who yeah. makes that move, I think, I think everyone, I, I know I did. I remember the first day, I remember the first day I went from being a sales development rep to being an inside salesperson. I started getting my first couple of deals. I was like, this is going to be a cakewalk. I can't believe who are these people who are not making their number. This is insane. And then, you know, about a month and a half, two months later, after I'd been through a couple of cycles and I had thought these deals were going to close and they didn't, I was like, whoa, this is different. So I think the first thing I'd say is don't worry, it's normal. Everyone has that experience. And it's just a matter of, of getting used to it and realizing that, okay, this is a new game. Okay, I need to become, I need to become, you know, a student of this game. And you have to understand, and this is where all the, you know, the sales books and, you know, there's millions of, you know, sales trainings that you could take that would kick in and start to tell you about this. But it's, that's where a lot of, you know, like the qualification and really understanding who's the buyer and, you know, do you have a good fit for their use case? And just having a really good handle on that and becoming a student of the craft in that area and taking advantage of the resources that your company is giving you, that's super important. Because I don't know if you've ever heard of the, there's a thing kind of that's been batted around for years. It's called the three T's. Have you ever heard of that before? No. Yeah. It's timing, territory, and talent. So those are like the things that a lot of, you know, kind of old timers like me would talk about, which is, yeah, there's three things that go into making somebody successful. There's timing, which is really, are you at the right company? Is the product, the company you're in really selling and hitting well? And so that's the first kind of principle. So that's either a, that's binary, either you're there and it's right or you're there and it's not. So that's the first thing you have to ask yourself because if the product's not really right, then you could find yourself in a scenario where it's really hard to sell no matter what. But if you do have good product and then, you know, after that, you do have a good territory, then the only thing left is the talent is you, right? And, and so I think a lot of people talk about the three T's as a way to really qualify, hey, is this me or is this the territory? I mean, there are territory issues. Things happen when you just... You know, a lot of segmentation of how people get handed territories, it's not perfect. It's not, it's not always fair. In fact, many times it's intended not to be fair. But you have to kind of figure that out and, and make sure you know, you know what's going on. And then just become a student of the craft, right? And make sure that you're doing everything you can to improve the one thing you can, you can change, which is, you know, your, your talent and your ability so that you can make sure that the other two, if they're there, you're going to succeed. Yeah. And, and what, if, what if you find yourself in a position that, maybe they're not there because you don't want to, you don't want to just like work at a company for a year or less than a year and then hop around a lot. It, I mean, it seems like it's changing, like, but you know, it's not a good look necessarily. Sure. But, I mean, is it just like the timing's not right? I, I have the right attitude and stuff, but maybe I'm not getting that mentorship. I'm not getting any sponsorship and this company sucks. Like, I got to go. Like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. what, are you, what are you supposed to do in that, in that situation? Uh, that's a hard one, right? I think, <laughs> so I think, well, I think the first piece of, of advice is like, 
do you really know the answer to that, right? Like, because before you do jump around, I think you want to really have thought through that and make sure that the, that the answer is, it's, it's like, if it's the company and you know it for a fact, okay, then it's probably a good thing to maybe start looking. But if you don't and you're, and you're, then you don't really know. I mean, sometimes people can't be honest with themselves about what's going on. So I'd say like, like, make sure you're super honest with yourself about, hey, are there a lot of other people who are doing well? Okay, it's probably, is a, is a company growing? Okay, it's probably a pretty good sign that the, the company's good. Okay, if you have a problem with your territory, okay, then let's make sure that the talent issue isn't there. And that's hard to assess because, you know, like everyone thinks that they're really good. But I'll say this, which is you can, you can affect territory, right? Like if you're really good at what you do, if you're super open to feedback, if you try every day to get better, you will get the attention of your manager because, because a lot of people don't do that. And the people that do make it easy to coach and to manage those people. And, and, and those are the people that managers really tend to gravitate towards and then when they see that you're making this progress and they see you're really trying, well, if you do have a territory issue, now you're putting it on the manager to say, man, this guy or girl's doing everything they can. You know, she's, she's showing up, she's working hard, you know, they've got the, the talk track down, but maybe there's just something with this territory. So maybe we need to realign that. And that, that could be the thing that's the breakthrough for you that all of a sudden changes everything else. So I think you have to be really honest with yourself about where it is and where you are in that process. And then the other thing I'd say too, is just kind of in terms of like jumping around. So like one of the things that we would look at when we're hiring, you can look at resumes, you can start to get a really good profile in terms of like just the forensics of the resume. Like, okay, have they been in hopping around all over the place? You know, have they consistently made their numbers? You know, do they have really strong references? Do I know anyone who knows this person who's referring them in? It's really hard to hire off the street, but if you have and, and I say this just for people who are, who are, you know, early in their careers and are coming out. If you can keep some consistency, if you can stay somewhere and do well, and if you can really start to climb the ranks there, then you've got something going for you. Because the other thing we look for is, are they getting consistently promoted, right? And so if you can stay somewhere, if you can make your numbers, show you're successful, then that, that kind of tenure along with that success is the most important thing that you can do because the people you know, up the line, like people like me and, and regional managers are going to see that on a resume. Right. Exactly. And so let me ask you this now, just shifting gears a little bit, you completely changed your career you know, a few years ago, going from this corporate, the corporate environment to starting your own company. Like, and, and I know it's a big question, but what has that process been like going from dealing with these, these norms that you have to follow to now starting your own thing. Yeah. No, it's it's interesting. It's definitely very very different, right? There's no there's no corporate backdrop anymore, right? There you're out of the nest. We've been working on the company and my co-founder have been working on it full-time for a number of years and I literally just joined about a month and a half ago full-time when we started really kind of getting further and further with the product and signing up more customers. But it's something I've always wanted to do. I, I, you know, I don't know why, but I always wanted to be an entrepreneur, even from the time I was in college. So it's, I guess it's just something that I'm following because I'd always wanted to do it. And we've been working on this idea, like I told you, it started about six years ago for a long time. And we just kept seeing it mature and, and getting better and really solving a big problem for people, which is you know, manual data entry kills everybody because everyone wants the contacts, but no one wants to enter the data. Oh, and yeah. so, yeah, so so far, so good. You know, there's there's still a long ways to go, but I, I love it. I, I really, the cool thing, and this is the thing that, that I, I enjoy is, you know, you're really left to a lot of creative devices. I mean, when I was at Boomi, there was a lot of opportunity for me to make an impact. You know, I got there when there were five field salespeople in North America. When I left, there were 80, you know, and I was involved in doing a lot of really cool things like building sales strategy, hiring all the different people, putting in the corporate structure, the organizational structure around how we're going to put people in different regions, you know, being, being just involved in how we do training. I mean, so many different things, but now it's all that plus, oh yeah, I got to make sure we take care of legal. Oh yeah. I'm now guess what? You're the guy who's in charge of marketing. Yeah. So you get to see all the different bits of the business and it's, it's really cool because you get to have your hand in really making it from the ground up. So it's, it's been, it's been something I've always wanted to do and it's been really, really awesome so far, but come back and talk to me in a year and a half and, and we'll see. Maybe it'll, it'll change. Maybe I'll have a different perspective. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, it has been, it has been a, a shorter time period, but you know, is it hard to transition from the corporate, the corporate world has so many benefits, you know, you've got, yeah. you've got your regular salary and you've got your, your health benefits and, and the, the structure that you're familiar with on how to be successful. I mean, you're fluent yeah. 
and how to be successful in this. And then to go from that to this, was that a difficult transition so far? It was, it's, it's nerve wracking. I'll put it that way, right? Like it's different. You're working on a whole, like you're working on everything. Like I, you know, we are working with customers. We are doing, you know, deals right now. We are obviously trying to do customer success and onboarding and all that stuff. So you're, you're, you're doing all the things you know, but you're also doing all these other things that you're not familiar with. Like I said, like marketing and legal and working on product. The biggest part I think was just that I'd always wanted to do it and I knew it was something I was going to do. And we had gotten this as kind of like the, I don't know if you remember this movie, it was called The Little Shop of Horrors. And it, did, do you remember that movie or, is that, or, or did I just yeah. date myself? And like, <laughs> yeah, dude, I, remember? I know that movie. I even know the plant. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, the plant. Yeah, I can't remember the plant's name, but like, it was like in the corner. It just kept growing, right? It's like they didn't know what to do. And to some yeah. degree, I kind of had that. Like we had this little thing. I was, it was just kept growing. And, I'm, and I, I mean, I knew I was going to leave at some point and go, and go do it. But it, it was helpful because, because I could see it was there. I could see we were going to, you know, I, hopefully we'll, we'll be successful. I could see that there was something there. But it was still the hardest part was just making that leap and saying, okay, this is it. I, you know, my resignation is going in. I'm leaving. I'm out of here. And I'm going to go do it. That just that it's like the looking over the cliff. Like, you know, you're going to jump off the cliff, but if you, if you stand and you don't want to stand and look over the cliff too long and think about it, cause it might make you have second guesses. So it's that part that's the most, you know, trepidation, but after you, after you go, everything else is fine. <laughs> so, so now, so now you're using all these skills. Do you still use your sales development skills with your new firm or is it just yeah. one of of other things that you're doing. No, I do. I literally, I mean, I am, you know, back to working with our customers and trying to, like, we have inbound leads coming in. I'm following up with them. We're actually putting together outbound sales development campaigns using automated processes to go try and connect with people that we think are suspects and potential targets. So we're, we literally have a whole mix of, hey, we have some marketing, we have SEO, we have different pages and content out there that are driving people to our site. But we also have like outbounding campaigns we're putting together that I'm responsible for building and starting and executing from you know soup to nuts. So yeah, the, the sales development skills and the sales skills in general just are super valuable. I, I, think in, you know, I think when you know how hard it is to get a dollar from somebody, it really helps you figure out other parts of the business. Like it's, it's funny where it has value because you know, I don't want to cold call all day long. So we focus on marketing. We focus on making the product, like the, uh, the concept of distribution and SaaS is a big one. Like, like how easy is it? Like, are you incenting people to use your product? Like, do you have a land and expand model? Is your product easy enough to use where you get in with one person, but they like it so much that other people want to use it. So you don't have to spend as much sales resources to go get it. And I think all those things from being in sales has really influenced what we've built because we do think about how to make the product really simple, but also able to scale and attack those bigger enterprise use cases. You know, when you're going to have thousands and thousands and thousands of salespeople and mailboxes you have to mine, and then creating a single database for all of those and then updating all the different systems. So I think it's, I think it's yeah. helped a lot. I mean, it's interesting because even some of the biggest companies where the product is viral, you know, it goes out and yes. people use it and they hand it to their friends, they still have huge sales development teams, you know, <laughs> and because... Yeah. So, Somebody has to be doing this, even if it's a totally viral product. And, and I, I, I like what, what you said in that, you know, you're spending your time thinking of how can we, how can we build and expand this with, without having me get on the phone and cold call all day, right? And, yeah, but, right. But it's like, at some point, you go to the tipping point where we have enough vir- virility, uh, enough people are using it. Now we can go out and hire some SDRs and start that program. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and not only that, but maybe we can hand them a set of like warmer leads where we're like, hey, we think there's an expand, like it's everything from SDR, even straight straight to inside sales, right? And and this is where I think, I mean, I think, especially in markets and products like ours, like the concept of sales development and inside sales is really, really important. You know, later on, probably have a field sales team, but in the beginning, you know, our models and go to markets are going to be much more oriented towards, you know, SDR type processes and inside sales processes because you can, it's scalable, it can become rhythmic, you can get really super, like, like I would say consistent cost structures to the way you actually acquire a customer. And so it's something that can be, 
tuned and rolled out and, and I would say kind of like operationalized. And so for us, that's super valuable. And, and so I, I think that's why like I, and I think a lot of companies fall into that category. You know, I think a lot of companies have a need to have that inside sales and that sales development engine really working well before they even think about field sales. Big time. I mean, and it's still, you, you still see the classic pattern is you build a product, you get a few customers, everything's great. You've got some inbound. And so now I'm going to hire a salesperson. And the, then the salesperson comes in and they're like, well, what am I supposed to be doing? You know, <laughs> like, yeah, this, right. my account is empty. And it's like, well, here's a list of like 500 potential <laughs> accounts. Go get them, Tiger. And yeah, like, right. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think oh, and <laughs> even field sales is changing too, right? I mean, I think because we're in a world now where everyone is is looking to use technology much more strategically than they were before. They're open to new technologies much more often than they were in the past. And so the ability for a field salesperson to do the kind of cold calling, cold intros and get deals, I think it's much more likely now. But you're right. I'm still in that world that I'd rather have. When we do hire our field salespeople, you want to get to a point where they do have some stuff coming inbound, but there's also some outbound that's a part of their mix. And then they're probably partnering with their sales development counterpart to put together those lists, those cadences, to try and really turn over that patch and look for people to get meetings, right? Because that field resource is so expensive. I'd really rather have a well-tuned SDR program that's set up to do outbound, because outbounding is super hard, right? I mean, you you know, and, and the people listening here know how much different outbound is than inbound. But I would say that if you really nail outbound, you have a superpower that I think a lot of people don't have. And I think some of the best sales and marketing companies that I've seen have really tuned that outbound muscle. And so, you know, in a perfect world, when you hire your field sales team, you've got a really well-developed outbound sales development process that takes into account who are your top targets, what people really match the best profile of who we should be going after. Let's put together the cadence and the, the orchestration of who's going to do what. And even if you get one or two deals out of that, that's a huge win, you know? Big time. I mean, Hey, amen. You're preaching to the choir, man. <laughs> yeah. No, no I be, I'm a believer. I mean, it's, yeah. it's the dream of predictable revenue, right? I mean, the, the book yep. you know, came out a few years ago. It's predictable revenue. It's something that you you have a lot of control over, but you got to figure out how to do it right. But Chris, hey, this has been amazing. I think a lot of people on this are maybe thinking about going up the chain of command and maybe even potentially starting their own company. How can people get in touch with you? How can people learn more about Sig Parser moving forward from this podcast? Yeah, sure. You can reach me at C Landry, so C L A N D R Y at SigParser.com. That's just my email address. We'd love to hear from anybody. You know, I'm I'm always interested in talking to different folks and I've also always been someone who's happy to do, you know, mentoring and, and other things throughout my career. So would love to hear from anybody. And you can also just check us out at just www.sigparser, that's S-I-G-P-A-R-S-E-R.com. Perfect. Well, dude, thank you so much for sharing all this knowledge. I, I got a whole notebook full of stuff here, and I'm sure that the listeners really benefited. Chris, good luck with everything, and we'll see you over on Sigparser. Hey, thanks so much, David. appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to the Sales Development Podcast, the only audio forum 100% focused and dedicated to sales development with your host, David Delaney. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on YouTube and take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes. Your support makes our show possible. If you are struggling with your sales development program, contact us at 10bound.com for a no-obligation exploratory call. Again, that's 10bound.com.